We're in this series, in the middle of this series, with a couple more weeks to go, looking at the end times. And again, this is just an overview of the end times. This is not an, an in-depth, detailed study of the end times, because that would take multiple, multiple weeks. And uh, I encourage you, and my heart and prayer for you is that this would spur you on to continue to study God's word in regards to the end times and studying God's word as a whole. Uh, but we've looked so far in this series that the first week we talked about the deception that Jesus warned us of and warned his disciples of when they asked when he would return, when the end times would be, when the last days would be. And the first thing Jesus told them was, watch out that no one deceives you. The point being is that we, even in our lives today, need to continue to guard our hearts, to guard our minds uh, with the word of God and what God's word says uh, as we await for Christ's return. And so that's so important that we stay close to him. The second week we looked at Israel's restoration uh, as a nation back in 1948 was a key moment and a sign, a key sign to the times that we're living in, in the last days, in the end times. And so we've got to continue to stand with Israel. We've got to continue to pray for them. And then last week we looked at the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, and I talked about how briefly at the top of the message, how, you know, Re Re Revelation is a future uh, prophetic book and talking about what the future is going to look like in many different ways. Um, at the same time, it, the core of it is all about Jesus and the worship of him. Yeah. It's really when you break it down, that's really what it's all about. And we looked at last Sunday at the seven churches and how the body of Christ needs to continue to live in remaining close to Jesus, the way Jesus addressed those uh, seven individual churches. And it represented the church age as well. And so today we're going to continue to look at the end time event when Jesus will return to rapture his church. When Jesus is going to return to rapture his church. Now the rapture is when Jesus is going to come back to take his bride, the church, the large C, the body of Christ to heaven with him. And there are some even today that don't believe in the rapture because you won't find the word rapture in the Bible. And if that's where you're at, let me encourage you with this, is that at the same time that you won't find the word rapture, you're also not going to find the words Trinity or Bible within Scripture either. But we believe in those. And so the Bible does talk about the rapture, which is Jesus returning for his church. And in recent years, there was an alarming survey that was done among believers or among Christians where 25% of that survey said that they no longer believe in the rapture or the literal return of Christ for his church. And that's a problem. Yeah. That is a big problem. And that number is actually growing. That percentage is growing in numbers. And so it's a problem because God's word talks about it, talks about the return of Christ for the church. And so we've always got to go back to scripture. What does God's word say? And we've got to hold fast to that, to guard our hearts, to guard our minds, and to be in the know of what God has told us. Because God has laid out his, his plan, and he's given us enough details of what that will look like, including the rapture. And so today, I want to give scriptural support of the rapture and why we should be looking towards Jesus and this event. Because the Bible talks about it. Again, just to summarize, in Revelation... In the book of Revelation, Jesus is giving John a revelation of what the future would look like. And he gives the church age, and then he goes on to give all these other different events that will happen one day. In other words, Jesus gives a timeline of events. Now, we don't know all of the dates of when everything takes place, but he does give a, a methodical timeline of events. And here's the deal is that Scripture says God is not a God of confusion. And yet many times we as mankind kind of confuse things, even when we read the Bible. And I talked a little bit about that, I think, last week, just that we've got to keep things simple. God made it simple for us. Jesus was giving John a simple timeline of things, of what it would look like before his return, ultimately, and then even beyond, and what that looks like. 
And so we've got to be in the know of that. We've got to study that. We've got to be aware of that. And it should bring us hope and joy and peace within our relationship with Christ. And so after Jesus addressed the seven churches individually, as well as chronologically within the church age, which again, we're still living in the church age until Christ returns, the next thing that John writes that Jesus tells him is this in Revelation chapter four, verses one and two. We looked at chapter three last week. John writes, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this, referring to after the church age. At once, verse two, he says, I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. So I wanna explain this for a moment. At this moment, when John is writing now in chapter four, verses one and two, and even through the rest of chapter four, it's not a coincidence that the first thing that John experiences after Jesus described the seven churches or the church age is his being taken to heaven. And John was the last remaining apostle at that moment. And so his elevation to heaven is a glimpse of the rapture of the church just before the tribulation. And I want to talk about more of of that this morning and give more scriptural support. Again, John doesn't specifically use the word rapture here, but looking at the timeline in Revelation, along with other scriptural support that we're going to look at today, points us to the rapture taking place just before the tribulation. And then if you were to continue to read on in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, It's looking at heaven. So John is getting this glimpse of what heaven is. Jesus is showing him what he's trying to reveal to him and to us. And then chapters 6 through 18 deal with the seven-year tribulation where the church is not discussed at all. So the church age happens. John is brought up to heaven at this moment. He's shown a glimpse of heaven in chapters 4 and 5. And then 6 through 18 deal with Israel and the restoration of Israel in that period during the seven-year tribulation. And so we also see in chapters 6 through 18 extensive language from the Old Testament that are, again, reveal that God is addressing Israel in that period of time, in those chapters. We also see symbolic uh, references to Israel in that moment, and that's why the church age is not talked about anymore, implying that the church is no longer on earth during that period. And then also it refers to the 70th week of Daniel that Daniel talked about, and I mentioned a couple weeks ago that God was talking about for that last seven years before he brings completion to the world at that point. And then we spend eternity with him forever. Here's what Jesus also said referring to the rapture. In John chapter 14, verses one through three, this is a popular uh, few verses. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled, You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am, referring to heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm coming back. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52, and this, these two verses are in the context of him talking about the rapture and the end times. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling or the blink of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Both of these passages of scripture are talking about the rapture. Jesus himself and then the apostle Paul is talking about it. They're both saying that Jesus is coming back. That he's going to take believers to heaven with him and that we're all going to be changed in a moment. And I also want you to see this is not 
or I should say the rapture is not the second coming of Christ. Because there's also the second coming and that's also talked about within scripture. And the differentiation of the two is at the rapture, Jesus is gonna come in the clouds and he's gonna come down towards earth, but he's not gonna come down to earth. He's gonna remain in the air and in the blink of an eye that we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so that's the rapture where he comes down for those that have been uh, fallen asleep or have already passed away. And their bodies are still here. They're going to be raised first. And all of those who remain are going to go to be with Jesus just in a moment. Okay. The second coming of Christ will take place after the seven year tribulation when Jesus comes back to rule for a thousand years in the millennial reign. And that's where his feet will come down and will touch the Mount of Olives is what is believed according to scripture. And then he's gonna rule and reign and, and bring judgment at that point. Paul goes on to talk about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, verses 13 to 18. And I wanna look at that. And again, the context is the rapture. So look with me and then we'll kind of break it apart just for a little bit. He says and writes, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord or till the rapture will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen. This is all good news. For those that know Jesus. And so we see Kevin, seven key points in this passage which summarize the truth of the rapture. And I want to look at them briefly for just a moment. The first is the realization. The realization. And we see that in verse 13 because Paul says in verse 13 that we need to understand the rapture so that we are not misinformed or uninformed about our believing loved ones who have already died and, and how they are not going to miss out on the rapture either. Because we have hope because of who Christ is. And so this scripture gives us peace in our hearts and lives. We're not, we're not to fear this event we're not to even fear for our loved ones that have already gone on to be with the Lord. And scripture very makes it clear that their spirit has already gone to be with Jesus, but their bodies, even according to this scripture, are going to be raised from the grave first to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I've been asked this question because of cremation has become so popular in today's culture. Well, how is that going to be? Because it talks about the bodies. But do we not think that the God of creation can take some ashes wherever they are at and bring them back to life in a bodily form, okay? So I say that to put you at peace. All right, second thing is, knowing this truth brings comfort and hope that we are gonna see our loved ones and friends again. That's why when they pass on and they've known Jesus, they've lived for him, they've accepted Christ, we have peace because of what the Bible tells us, not just because we're making something up, okay? The second thing we see is the revelation that Paul talks about here, and that's seen in verse 15a, the first part of 15. Paul's saying, this is God's word in what God's word said. This is God's plan. Paul's saying, this is not mine. I'm not just telling you something that I've made up. Paul's, he's saying, I'm just repeating what the Lord has already said to you. So be encouraged by his word. The third thing Paul talks about is the return. And we see that in verses 15b and 16. According to these two verses, at the time of the rapture, Jesus himself will come in the clouds. And he's going to return accompanied by three different things that we see here. A commanding shout, the call of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. 
And these things will happen to signal that Jesus is here for his bride. The fourth thing that we see is the resurrection. And we see that in 16b, when Jesus comes down from heaven, the dead bodies of believers will rise first and be reunited with their perfected spirits that are with the Lord already. And that's why it says the dead in Christ will rise first. And so these resurrected bodies will be glorified into incorruptible bodies made for the heavenly realm, made for heaven and eternity. The next thing that we see is the removal in verse 17a, because it says in that verse that as soon as the dead are raised, living believers will immediately be transformed and translated into the presence of Jesus without ever tasting physical death here on earth. And Paul writes, we who are alive and remain on the earth will be caught up together with the dead in Christ, whose bodies have been raised to life again, and we're gonna meet them in the air. Think about it, there's gonna be millions if not more, of believers who will never taste death that are gonna be raptured in an instant into the presence of the Lord. The sixth thing that we see is the reunion. Verse 17 also tells us that the dead in Christ, the living saints, will all be raptured together. It will be the greatest reunion of all time as we spend eternity together with Jesus from that moment on. And it's gonna be so awesome beyond words when all the saints of the church age meet Jesus. Think about that. There really is nothing to fear if we know the Lord. And the last thing I wanna look at and point out of this passage is the reassurance found in verse 18, because Paul tells us there to encourage or comfort one another with these words and the truth about the rapture. Knowing that there's a rapture brings comfort and it should bring comfort to you and I and hope to all of God's people, especially when a believing loved one dies, that this isn't the end, that there's more that God has in store for us. This all comes to an end one day, but yet the best is yet to come with the Lord. So God wants us to be hopeful, remain in hope, but also to continually remind and encourage each other that this life is temporary that we overcome through Jesus. And so I wanna encourage you today, church, that even as we just read and just talked about that, that we as brothers and sisters in the Lord need to continue to remind each other when we're going through the trials, when we're going through the problems, when the world seems to be falling apart in different ways at different times, that we encourage one another and never forget that, that you know what, just just remember that our eternity is still coming that Jesus is coming back for us, that we gotta remain ready, we've gotta stay ready, we've gotta stay close to Jesus. When our loved ones pass away, that we are reminded and remind each other that, you know what, they're, they're with the Lord. They're in God's presence. There's no more suffering. There's no more pain if they knew Jesus. And that's what God wants us to do as his people that we would overcome in this life by staying true to his word and reminding one another of what God's word tells us. One day we're gonna be with those who have gone on before us for all of eternity. And Paul then writes and commends the church in Thessalonica and he says and talks about how their faith in God became known everywhere. And here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9b and 10, he says, They, others, tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, what wrath is he talking about? He's talking about the wrath of God on the earth for the, during the seven year tribulation. And he's making it very clear that God is going to rescue his people before that time of wrath. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pleasant. Just read Revelation 6 through 18. And it's very clear how devastating it's going to be at that point for all who have rejected God and because of mankind's sin against God. Looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, 
This chapter is talking about the Antichrist, or also known as the man of lawlessness, the way Paul writes it. And he says in verse 5, he says, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, holding the Antichrist back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Referring to Jesus' second coming, not the rapture at that point, okay? So here's the point of these two passages that I just read out of Thessalonians is that the scripture overwhelmingly points to a pre-tribulation rapture. And there are other scriptures that I want to give you and, and look at and talk about here in a moment. But first of all, in looking at this Second Thessalonians, who is the restrainer that Paul is writing about? It's the Holy Spirit. If you think about it for a moment, God's Spirit today is at work in and through us, the body of Christ, right? God's spirit is here. He's working on the earth. He's working through his church, his people. He's alive and well within the body of Christ. And he's accomplishing God's plans and purposes here and now. So because God's spirit is here, he's the one that is holding back the Antichrist from coming into play. You're tracking with me? But when the church is raptured, the Holy Spirit is now gone from the earth in just a moment. When you think about it in that context and you begin to ponder that and look at different scriptures, how it all works together, in just a moment, the Holy Spirit's gonna be removed from the earth. And now nothing's holding back the Antichrist from coming into power. That's one reason why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture as a church. And also in Revelation chapter three, verse 10, last week we talked about when Jesus was addressing the church of Philadelphia and because of their faithfulness to him, because they remained close to Jesus, he, he told them that he was gonna keep them from the hour of trial. What was the hour of trial? The hour of trial is the seven year tribulation. He's saying that because you loved me, I'm going to spare you from that trial because there's going to be no greater trial in the history of the world than during that seven years. That's how bad it's going to be. Then we, again, we also see in Revelation chapter um, 6 to 18 that the church is not mentioned, even chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation, the church is not mentioned here on earth any longer. And so, again, these are different scriptural references that point to a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I know that there are some who believe in a, in a mid-tribulation rapture, um, which means that Jesus would come and return for the church at the halfway mark, the three and a half year point of the seven years. And then there's also some who believe in a post-tribulation rapture that Jesus will come and rapture the church at the end of the seven year tribulation. And then we will come, we'll go up in the air with him, and then we'll come back down to rule and reign with him for the thousand year millennial reign. Now, in just in thinking about that, practically, the three and a half year or the mid and the post tribulation theological perspective, Jesus also tells us in scripture that no man knows the hour or time when he's coming. But we also will know there's enough information given about what the seven year tribulation is gonna look like. Meaning that there's enough things we can see to go, okay, everything is coming into play. There's an antichrist. And so at that point, we would kind of have some type of time frame, wouldn't we? If we believe in a mid-year tribulation at the three and a half years from that starting point, generally speaking, or the end of the seven years. And that's another reason why we believe in a pre-tribulation because, again, no man knows the hour when Jesus is coming back. And so we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. So there's multiple scriptural support, and it really overwhelmingly points to a pre-tribulation rapture. 
Paul, if you'll look with me, also says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, that the coming of the lawless one, meaning the Antichrist, will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. This scripture is sometimes overlooked but very important to understand for us as believers. Again, lawlessness is already at work. The spirit of lawlessness is already at work in the world. The Bible talks about that. And it's going to get worse once the Antichrist comes into power. And during that tribulation period, the Bible is talking about here it's how difficult it's going to be in order to accept Christ, to follow Christ, and to live for him because of, of the difficulties and challenges of the judgment during that period of time on the earth. And here's the point that I want to make is that now is the time to know and live for Jesus. Now is the time to accept Christ. Don't put it off. Now is the time to live for him. This is something that we don't want to mess with, according to what this scripture is telling us. You don't want to live your life saying that, man, I've got time to live for Jesus. I'm going to put it off. And then Jesus comes back in a moment for his church, and then you're left behind. Because you want to do what you want to do here and now and live the way that you want to live. That's dangerous thinking and you're playing with your eternity and where you're going to spend it, whether heaven or hell. Second thing is that even if you've had a chance to accept and live for Jesus during the tribulation, you're not going to want to live during that time. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pretty. Jesus said it will be the most distressed time in history of all time. There's going to come a point where you won't be able to buy or sell anything, including food, unless you take the mark of the beast, which is the mark of the Antichrist. I mean, it's a permanent decision to reject God if you take that mark. You're in essence saying, I'm not going to trust you, God. I'm not putting my faith in you. I'm taking the mark. I'm putting my trust in the Antichrist, which is ultimately Satan behind it all. And at that point, those who take the mark will become destined to hell for all of eternity. And Jesus is going to tell those people, I never knew you, according to what other scriptures he said. And if those who refuse the mark of the beast during that time do so, they're probably going to lose their life. And so now's the time to accept and live for Jesus. And that's what really what Paul is talking about even in this passage. He's saying those that have rejected God during this time, during the church age, if they're alive when the rapture happens, they're going to be deceived. There's going to be all sorts of displays of powers and signs and wonders, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians that we just read. And they're going to perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. In other words, because they've rejected the Lord. And so for this reason, in verse 11, Paul says, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they'll believe the lie. That's why it's so important even here and now, before the rapture, church, that we remain close to Jesus. Amen. We stay tuned into God's word. What does God's word tell us? What does God's word say? Just because someone comes up with a teaching that sounds right, if it doesn't, if it's not scripturally based and grounded, then we shouldn't believe it. And that's why God warns us and he gives us a heads up about this, even in this passage of scripture. Jesus is coming back for his church. He's promised it and he's coming back soon. And so we have to be ready. Don't even, don't even allow Satan or the world to deceive you from the truth. And that's why the Bible talks about how the Antichrist spirit is already here working. We've seen that even in recent years. 
In 2020, with the global pandemic, there's elements of the Antichrist spirit already at work. With how much control can we get away with? This is the reality. Where is this all going? This is all going towards the end times. God's word talks about this. And so we can't be taken off guard. We can't get, live in fear, but we've got to remain ready. We've got to know God's word. We've got to prepare our hearts and stay ready to what God is going to do. And one day he's going to come back for us, the church. The rapture, in other words, is imminent. And once it happens, you can't change your mind either way. Either you're in or you're out. And I want to talk a little bit about that here in the next couple moments. Let's go back first to Matthew chapter 24 that we looked at just a couple weeks ago and talking about the end times, last days. And Jesus is talking here to his disciples and us. And in chapter 24, verses 42 through 44, Jesus says, Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man or Jesus will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So here's the point for us is that as we watch and wait for Jesus to return for us, we need to prepare by devoting ourselves to him. We've got to prepare, we've got to be ready by devoting ourselves to him. In explaining this, Jesus communicated about the rapture so that we, the church, his bride, would prepare for our wedding to him one day, which is talked about in Revelation chapter 19. The marriage supper of the Lamb, which is the church being married to Jesus for all of eternity. And that word preparation means devotion. It's preparing ourselves and our lives now in everything that we do so that we are devoted in everything to seeing Jesus one day. That our eyes are kept on him. The moment that we stop being devoted to Jesus here and now is the moment that we stop preparing to see him. And that's why Jesus talked about in the church at Laodicea becoming lukewarm. Because they took their eyes off of Christ And it became just all muddied with the world. And that's why Jesus also talked about the rapture in the context of a Galilean wedding. And I want to give you just a little bit of history and context of what that looks like because it correlates with the rapture. And that's why the disciples knew what Jesus was talking about, that he was going to come back for them one day. In Galilee, the betrothal between a young groom and bride was the most important event in any town. In fact, word would quickly spread on the streets and people would rush to witness the betrothal. They would witness this event. And the father of the groom and the father of the bride would both attend and there were witnesses to ratify this covenant of marriage. And so the bride at that moment in the betrothal was given a written covenant or proposal of marriage from the groom's father. And he would ask the bride, do you agree on these terms? And if she said yes, she couldn't undo the terms because it became a covenant relationship at that moment. And then at that moment, if, when she said yes, gifts were exchanged. And the most extravagant gift went to the bride. And so the groom's father gave a dowry to the bride's father But contrary to popular belief, this dowry was not a purchase of the bride herself. It was an insurance policy to take care of the bride if something should happen to the groom. And then at that moment, the groom would then hand a cup of wine called the cup of joy with both hands reverently towards her and respectfully and fearfully to the bride-to-be. And the bride now at that moment had the choice to either accept or reject this offer of marriage. In other words, she had all the power in that moment. If she drank from the cup, she accepted the terms of marriage. If she rejected the offer, she handed the cup back without drinking from it. And so after accepting the offer and drinking from the cup, the bride handed the cup back then to the groom. And then the groom drank from the same cup to solidify the new covenant between them to be married on a set date. And then for all to hear, 
In that moment, the groom said publicly to everybody witnessing this event that I will not drink from this cup again until I drink it again with you in my father's house. Because the groom would go back to the father's house and prepare a room, prepare a place for he and his bride to live. And we see that even in the Last Supper. Jesus said something similar to his disciples. In Luke chapter 22, verses 14, 14 through 18, that I'm not going to eat this bread or I'm not going to drink this cup until the kingdom one day when we are doing it together at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is he, he was referring to. So I want you to see the correlation between the Galilean wedding and our relationship with Jesus as the church. As the bride of Christ, God the Father paid the dowry for our salvation with the most extravagant gift, which was his son. And Jesus sealed the deal for us by giving his own life, which was our insurance policy for eternal life. And now we belong to him. And so he, being Jesus, the groom, promised to come back for us, the bride for us one day. That's why the rapture has to happen. And that's why we even receive communion on a regular basis as the church, as the body of Christ, to be reminded of what Jesus not only did for us on the cross, but that he's coming back for us one day. He's waiting to eat the bread and drink the cup. But we've accepted the terms of salvation if we've given our heart and life to Jesus. We're saying, Jesus, I'm living for you. And so when we receive the bread and drink the juice together, we're saying, Jesus, I'm giving you and dedicating my life one more time to you today. I believe in you. I'm thankful that you're coming back for me one day. And I've accepted the terms of salvation. How powerful is that? But then Jesus didn't even stop there. He continued into Matthew chapter 25 to talk about the parable of the 10 virgins. And he said, all 10 bridesmaids started out with good intentions of waiting for the groom, but not all 10 finished. Five kept oil in their lamps at all times and the other five ran out of oil and they eventually had to go get more oil. But in the meantime, the groom returned referring to Jesus coming back for his church and those who are not ready for his return. And the oil in this parable represents the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Jesus was saying, or he's telling us, that the ones who are truly following him as Lord and create room for his spirit, his oil, are the ones who are ready for his return because the Holy Spirit is keeping us passionate for Jesus as we wait for his return. And here's the point, church, that we need to understand in the seriousness of this all is that once the rapture happens, no one can change their mind. It's not, there's Jesus. You know, Lord, I haven't been living for you with a right heart and a right life. So God, in this moment, I'm going to make it right. That's not how it happens. In the blink of an eye that we already read, just like that. Jesus is coming back and taking his church. So we have to be ready now. Amen. We have to stay ready now to stay close to Jesus. Because even in Matthew 25, in the parable of the 10 virgins, in verses 10 through 12, it, Jesus talks about after those who were ready went into the wedding banquet with their groom at the father's house and the doors were shut. At that moment, it was decided who was a part of the wedding and who wasn't. You couldn't change your mind either way. And in that culture, in that time, for seven days and nights, people were locked out or locked in at the Galilean wedding. They couldn't get in or out. That's why the disciples knew what Jesus was talking about when he talked about the rapture and gave this parable to them. The marriage supper of the lamb resembled the Galilean wedding. Once back at the father's house, the wedding feast would begin. And the Bible says the marriage supper of the lamb is the wedding banquet or feast for Jesus and for us in heaven after the rapture, according to Revelation 19. And so the Bible then warns us, he warns, it warns those who miss the return of Christ are destined to take part in the wrath of God during the seven-year tribulation. 
which is poured out on a world who has rejected God. And according to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20 and 21, I encourage you to go back and look that up. Isaiah 26, 20 and 21, God tells his people to enter their rooms and shut the doors behind them and hide themselves for a little while until his wrath passes by. That's another indication of a pre-tribulation rapture. And it's not talking about the church or the church age is talking about Israel because they're gonna experience the seven year tribulation and it's about their fullness of their restoration with the Lord, their relationship with him. But God tells them to go in and shut the doors behind and hide themselves for a little while while his wrath passes by. Church, it's so important that we not only understand that Jesus is coming back, but why he's coming back for his bride and that we can't change our mind when the rapture happens. Again, we've got to stay ready and prepared for Christ's return. And the Bible says, in the last days, there will be a great falling away of those who once believe in Jesus, but now they've walked away. We talked a little bit about that, and we're even seeing that happen today with those that have known Christ, but have walked away from him. And there've been many who've walked away from their faith in Jesus or have fallen asleep spiritually. And Peter talks about this falling away in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 9, and then we'll look at verses 17, 18 on the screen. Peter says in verse 3, he says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And they will say, where is this coming that Jesus or he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed, talking about the time of Noah when God flooded the earth and destroyed the world at that time. Verse 7 says, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. If you were to continue to read on to verse 10, even beyond it, it says there, a day will come, that day will come like a thief for all of a sudden. Again, the rapture is going to happen just like that. And in verses 17 through 18, and these are going to be on the screen for you. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. The warning that scripture gives us to make sure that we are not falling away from the error of the lawlessness or the spirit of lawlessness throughout the earth and that we don't fall away from our secure position. What's it talking about there? It's talking about that we can choose to walk away from our relationship with the Lord. Nobody can steal our salvation from us Because the Bible tells us that Jesus told us that, that nobody can snatch us out of his hand. So nobody can steal your salvation, but you can choose to intentionally walk away from your relationship with Christ. And that's how you can fall from your secure position in the Lord by choosing to walk away. And that's why even, again, we talked about last week how Jesus said that If you remain faithful to me, I'm not going to blot your name out of the book of life because our name has to be in the book of life in order to receive eternal life. The reference of that is that we can have our name blotted out if we walk away from our relationship with Jesus intentionally. And so here's the point, the closing point, is that we must keep our eyes on Jesus and compel others to experience Christ also. Church, our purpose while we're here on this earth is to stay ready for Jesus like we've talked about today. But we're also here to compel others to accept Christ. 
And that's why Jesus told the parable of the great banquet, which is in heaven, in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. And I want to read these verses to you as we close. Is that Luke writes and he says, when one of those at the table with Jesus heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. And the servant came back and reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you had ordered has been done, but there is still room. And then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. And so this gives us a picture of the father's heart, first of all. That the father has invited the world to his, to his wedding banquet one day in heaven with Jesus. The offer of salvation. Jesus came, he's given his life. The gospel message continues to go out and to be preached and to be shared. And God is looking for more to come into his family, to come into his kingdom, to be a part so that they would not miss out. And we see the passion of our heavenly father in this. The master of this banquet is the heaven, our heavenly father. And he's looking for people. And the father's heart again is that all would come. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to be separated from him for all of eternity. But at the same time, Jesus says, too many have made excuses as to why they can't accept, why they can't believe in, or why they can't follow Jesus. They're too busy. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I've got other plans, and so I can't. And yet we who already believe in and know Jesus are his servants. And God has called us to go out and to find others because the Father's looking for people. He doesn't want them to miss out on the rapture. He doesn't want them to miss out on eternal life in heaven with Jesus. And God makes it so clear to us that we are to compel others about the good news about Christ so that they can experience him as well. And that word compel is just not the pretty word like, hey, I, I, I want you to come with me. Have anybody told you about Jesus? And Okay, no worries. And there is boundaries at times that we can't force Jesus on people. But the, the word compel really speaks of the passion that you and I are to have as believers. Are we doing everything within our power, within our ability to share Christ with the world around us? Because our Father's looking for more people to come to his banquet. He's looking for more people to come to know him so they can spend eternity in heaven. That's his heart. That's his desire. And God has called you and I, the church, along with the global church, who claims Jesus as Savior and Lord to be passionate about the lost, to be passionate about those who don't know him yet, that we would be passionate, we would compel people. Like, I'm praying for you. You may reject him here in this moment, but there's, you need to accept him. I want you to be in heaven with me one day, and Jesus is the truth, the life, and the way. There's no other way to heaven other than through Christ. And I would dare say that God is compelling us to compel others to come into his family. And so my challenge is, as we wrap up today's message, is that Jesus is coming back. But what compelling others looks like is, is our purpose statement as a church. It's helping people find Jesus. We're doing everything within our power to lead people to Christ. We can't force them 
but we're doing everything within our ability and allowing the Holy Spirit to do his part to soften their hearts to the gospel, to Christ. And then also the second part of that is transforming culture. That when the church is the salt and the light, that when we speak truth, that when we live the truth, that when we compel others, people will see Jesus in us as the church, which transforms the world around us. It changes hearts and lives because we're inviting them to the banquet that the Father is inviting them to.